Good morning. Today, this is the Vermont House Human Services Committee, and this is um, Friday, January 15th. And while the bulk of the morning's agenda will be um, sort of uh, focused on getting um, feedback and testimony from um, providers and others um, as it relates to um, COVID-19 response and impact on elders and um, people with uh, disabilities. Uh, as we begin um, now, and I see that the uh, commissioner of, um, of Dale is here. So if the commissioner of Dale is um, here, um, rather than I was going to have us chat a little bit about the budget adjustment, just know that the budget adjustment um, has been um, um, presented to House uh, Appropriations. Um, you can see it on YouTube at 9 a.m. and we'll talk about that later this afternoon. Um, uh, Commissioner Hutt, thank you very much. I realized that you need to you needed to be uh, in two places at once. Um, and, and so, uh, and Representative um, McFawn, thank you, um, everyone. And so let us begin with um, our testimony and focus on uh, how COVID-19 has impacted um, our um, elders and um, Rep uh, Commissioner Hutt. Uh, good morning, everybody. For the record, Monica Hutt. I'm the Commissioner at the Department of Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living. Happy New Year to all of you. It's lovely to see you. I let Representative McFawn know that I was going to throw him under the bus immediately and, and blame him for me being late. <laughs> <laughs> but I was at least honest with him about that initially, so he knew that that was coming. Um, it's really lovely to see all those of you who are returning and to meet <coughs> members of the committee. Hopefully we'll have a chance to touch base and just a, a quick invite. Um, if it ever is helpful for you to sit with me or any of my staff just to get a little bit of a 101 on the Department of Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living, I'm happy to do that. Um, I even have a PowerPoint all ready to go because I anticipated that that might be necessary. So it is more information than you will ever want um, but it, we are a, a department that actually has a pretty broad reach and a lot of different populations that we serve and, and many, many community partners that we connect with and work with. So um, it might be helpful. Uh, I The notes that I got as I was um, uh, hearing from what the committee wanted were, were four different topic areas. So let me tell you what I think I'm talking about and then you can um, modify. Uh, so I, I understood that you wanted um, updates on the COVID response in long-term care, wanted me to speak to adult day programs specifically a little bit, um, a little bit about the impact on elder abuse and financial exploitation. So I have some data about that that I can share. Um, and then finally, uh, Rep. Chairwoman Pugh, I, I understood that you wanted me to talk a little bit about, maybe just give a, a, a quick uh, frame about the transfer of ownership issue for nursing homes and how that's working right now so that that can be a conversation into the future. Um, yes, in terms of how that um, has impact, you know, that probably needs to be a discussion that this last piece. So yes, um, in some respects, we are focused, we are focused for the most part on um, uh, one of the most vulnerable populations as we uh, uh, explore and think about COVID-19 and how um, they are being, um, how it is for them and how our service delivery system is impacting that. Whether it is a relationship to COVID-19 or whether it is um, just a, a coincidence in terms of time, um, uh, during this same period of time, during the past 10 months, there has been, um, what seems to be a significant ownership change in nursing homes and long-term care facilities in the state and um, a lot of transfer of ownership. And then in fact, um, 
uh, one, one, one entity owning a bunch. And um, so that's why that is there. And so I, I can I can certainly at the end of my testimony just talk about how that process works and just give you a, just a tiny bit of um, framework for maybe some future conversations. Okay, so let me just jump in then, um, and I'm going to just start. And I know uh, I know that um, many of you were most of you were probably part of the testimony yesterday, and so I won't focus um, so much on the funding amounts. And I'm actually kind of terrified to do that without Sarah Clark to to check my numbers. <laughs> We've been very clear that we need to have a, a what does she call it a a, a, a a lodestone of truth or around the finances because it's been so fast and furious. So, well, um, represent. I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner. Um, Hutt, that's sort of why we're having you all and folks here this after, this morning. We got the we got the numbers, and um, we're the people committee. I know. <laughs> thank, so, thank, so, thank so, so, we, so, so we want to know how the people the people are um, are um, are doing. Perfect. And, um, and and what um, what's worked and should continue, and um, what we clearly what are the holes? Absolutely. What are the um, what are the opportunities for making changes in the immediate future and long term? Okay, so let me so let me talk to you a little bit about the response, particularly long term care. I think I will preface everything that I'm gonna say with the fact that we've had a lot of opportunity to hear from other states across the country. You know, different, different. many of us have, had, have been in conversations with our counterparts across the country. Um, and, and I will say that um, Vermont's response has been strong, has been cohesive, has been effective. Um, and, and I will tell you without a doubt in my mind that that is not true across the rest of the country. And I think that a lot of people credit that to our size. And I understand that, but we have operated on relationships that have been built across the legislature, across the administration, across our community partners and with our facilities. So our size is important but the relationships that we all have focused on for so long have been much more important. And I just, I, 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 I get a little bit um, frustrated when people say, well, it's because you're small. Well, maybe it's because we're small enough to have spent time on the things that were important. So I think that our ability to act quickly uh, and cohesively across the legislature and the administration, um, the, the ability to, I was sharing with, with Laura Pelosi, you know, I was making calls at eight o'clock on Tuesday to some long-term care facilities. And all I had to do was say, hey, it's Monica. And they were like, oh, how are you? You know, so we have built that kind of a connection in this state. Um, and I think that that's just really powerful. In terms of our long-term care facilities, which is kind of where I want to start this conversation, when we think about that, we think about those facilities as our skilled nursing facilities, our residential care programs, our assisted living facilities, and our therapeutic community residences. And the response in Vermont has been across all four of those licensed um, residential facilities. Other states have bifurcated it a little bit differently, and they've looked at nursing homes kind of separate from all of those other residential care facilities. I will tell you that we identified early on that the biggest risks were in those smaller facilities that didn't have um, the requirements for a medical director or a director of nursing. Um, you know, it, we saw it hit our nursing homes hard, which was um, not unexpected, um, but they really had the capacity to address it in a way that a residential care home with 10 residents and five staff didn't have. Um, and we have still seen some really remarkable responses from that community. So I am incredibly proud of that and incredibly proud of them and the staff that just hung in there. Um, as well as the communities that created meal trains and, and check-ins and put signs on their lawns and, you know, celebrated the workforce that, sorry, that just kept going. I mean, really, that just kept going. 
It's unbelievable to me. Sorry, I didn't think that was gonna happen. So from a state perspective, I think that what we have done really well is, um, is we did a tremendous amount of preparation work. And I know I've already testified to this committee about what we did to get ready in terms of training and technical assistance and surveys with the facilities so that they would have their infection prevention and control procedures in hand. Um, but, but more recently, as we've gotten back into this second level of surge, we have a really aggressive testing strategy that the state is sponsoring and supporting. Um, so in facilities, they are testing uh, two kinds of tests, point of care, so uh, antigen tests, right? So a point of care, it's called a POC test. Um, and then a PCR test. I don't know what that stands for, but that's the test that goes to the laboratory to be um, screened and, and determine whether or not there's positivity. And we've been using those two kinds of tests aggressively in facilities. We would love to have more of the, of the point of care antigen tests, but those are limited at a federal level. But part of that really aggressive testing strategy has been enacted in both nursing homes and in all of those other facilities that I talked about. And that has been uh, the way for us to identify cases very early on and then act, which has been critical, I think, in this response. That is a tremendous amount of work that our facilities took on, um, and also a tremendous amount of work from the Vermont Department of Health, and frankly, from a Dale team, but, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. So we've had this aggressive testing strategy, and we created this contract through support from the legislature and funding with the, with the group that's able, uh, CIC Broad, who is an outside lab who's been able to assist with those tests. So they have a direct relationship with every facility in the state, enabling them to access that testing capacity. We've had ongoing technical assistance around infection prevention and control measures. So um, our state survey agency has been able to go in and to do both on-site and telephonic uh, assessments of strategies. And the VDH team even developed sort of a video process where you can have an administrator walk around the building with a camera and show them, this is how we're set up. These are where the doors are. Here's the nurse's station. Here's the break room. How do we make this safe? And the VDH team just consults literally in real time. We've developed this rapid response team, and that's a partnership between VDH and Dale. So the VDH EPI program, the epidemiological team, um, and five Dale staff, myself included, that consult with every single facility where even a single positive is developed. So those are seven or eight phone calls literally every day of the week where we are sitting with facilities to talk about when did that positive get identified? What's the infectious period? What do you need to get through this? Um, do, what do you have for PPE? Can we get you some more? What do you need for staffing? What are the gaps? One of the things that was identified really early on is that as soon as there's a positive, there is an impact to staffing whether that's staff that is fearful and doesn't want to come in, or staff that are testing positive and can't be coming in, or staff that were close contacts of a positive re resident or other staff person that need to be excluded while we watch and see. The staffing impact is immediate, absolute, and it happens right away. It mitigates over the next couple of weeks, but immediately it creates a crisis. Um, and so we have worked with facilities to figure out what resources they have, what contracts they can build with staffing agencies, where they can pull from within their organization. And in the worst case scenarios, we developed an emergency staffing pool. So we've got 40 people on contract through TLC that we deploy at Dale when there is a need. It's a, it's a tiny pool, it's been used a lot, but I think it has really saved some facilities who just didn't have the resources to pull. Again, a nursing home has some capacity that a small tiny res care isn't going to have and they can't be fussing with not knowing where the person's gonna come in to, to be awake for the night shift. They just need somebody there. Um, and so that staffing pool has been really critical. 
Um, we also have started using, and I believe that Sarah Clark spoke to it yesterday, um, we realize with the CRF funds that an ongoing need right now, we've used it to create these little tiny grants to some very small facilities. So again, not necessarily needed for a nursing home, but for a tall a, a facility that immediately gets hit for them to be able to buy catering for meals because their they're one, they're one kitchen staff, the single person is no longer able to come into work, they still need to feed people. And so to be able to pay for that or to buy really expensive masks, because as was pointed out yesterday, as soon as the need for PPE became great, every company that produced it just decided to take advantage of that and the costs are obscene. Um, so those grants have been critical to be able to buy the supplies that you need. In one instance, a facility bought commodes so that everybody could stay in their rooms because part of the prevention strategies is keeping people in their rooms behind a closed door. And that makes a shared bathroom, which is often the case in a residential care facility, impossible. Right. So it's been amazing what we've seen and just sort of the basic need and that grant program has been really, really helpful. And finally, right now, we're obviously working on the, on, the, on the more hopeful upswing end because of the vaccination process. Um, one of the real aggressive goals and charges from the governor and the secretary was to make sure that all of our long-term care facilities could have a first dose of the vaccine um, in January. Um, so as soon as the program became available to us, and we've spent the last couple of weeks with the federal pharmacy partners, the three pharmacies that are partnering with us through the federal government, and they have been amazing about moving up every clinic so that every res care, every nursing home, every assisted living will have their first vaccination clinic by the end of this month. Um, we're still working on the TCRs. There's only about 10 in, in the state, um, but we are working to get those moved up as well. But really trying to focus on vaccination aggressively because we know that that's where we need to be. I see that there may be some questions, so I'm gonna stop for a second. Uh, um, Commissioner, um, partly because we have new members, I'll blame it on them, but also um, some of us may have forgotten. Um, you've used some alphabet soup and you just right. said, that's okay. And you just said T, C, L, or R. Um, and if you could say what they are. Sure. So those are all just different variations of licensing and licensure. So it, every, every level of licensing and licensure has its own um, requirements. So skilled nursing facilities are, you'll often hear people talk about them as SNPs. So nursing homes, skilled nursing facilities in Vermont, they tend to be the same thing. It was, took me the longest time, like what's a SNF? Yeah, other than the obvious thing. But um, so skilled nursing facility, SNF. Um, the next is residential care. And again, again, you're always gonna hear that called res care. Different level of licensure. Um, typically, I, I always, and I know Laura will probably scream when I say this, but I just tend to think about them more as our old fashioned boarding houses. They, they provide so much more than that. They actually do get into medical care for, for individuals, but they are set up in a way where there are communal meals, communal activities. A lot of times there are shared rooms and shared bathrooms, um, but ResCare also does take on um, higher levels of care and can get variances for individuals who actually need nursing home level of care. So they are really a hybrid in the state of Vermont. Assisted living um, is, is, a, is a kind of a licensure and a kind of a facility that has to be able to guarantee that somebody can live there independently, typically in their own apartment with their own bathroom and sometimes a kitchenette. Um, but assisted living has to be able to meet needs until the end of someone's life. So the variation in the kind of care that they receive or are able to provide in the kind of medical clinical capacity they need to have can be really variable depending on who's there. Um, and finally, TCR, Therapeutic Community Residence. Um, TCRs are typically more short-term. People are not living in a TCR as a long-term. It's typically more of a treatment and intervention. Um, there's a clinical component and a goal of care for someone. So those tend to be more short-term. Again, in Vermont, we have looked at all of these as licensed residences, and so the same level of risk you might argue that TCR has more risk if people are moving in and out more frequently, um, but the reality is that we've lumped them into thinking about long-term care and planning for them in the same way. 
Is that helpful? That's really short. And I know not actually that much about it, to be honest with you. So what I've just said to you is all I've got in terms of that information. It's great. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay. So actually, that's the that's really what I wanted to talk about in terms of the response to long term care. I think in terms of the impacts, you know, one of the things that I mentioned yesterday is that um, movement in that system typically flows pretty freely. People will move from hospital into nursing home for a short term stay or rehab. From there, they might go to a residential care home for more longer term um, mm -hmm. living. But I think that at all levels of our system, there's a, a stuckness. You know, it's hard to discharge from a hospital to a nursing home with in, in the COVID environment. You know, you need people to be, um, you need to be clear if somebody's positive or negative before they're discharging. There's a lot of quarantining that has to happen as you move from one facility to another. Uh, that's been a huge problem. I, and it has made it challenging to move people as fluidly as they should be moving to be at the right level of care. The isolation for folks has been profound. And we've all talked about that. I talked with many of you individually about that. There's, I don't know that there's any way to gauge the physical and emotional and mental health impacts of isolation, both in a facility but then imagine that a facility an outbreak goes in and out of even more intensive isolation. So you might have a facility where you're not getting visitors and that's one level of impact. You then look at a facility an outbreak and literally people aren't even mingling within the facility. So folks have been in their rooms in the middle of an outbreak, they are in their rooms um, to prevent the spread, to keep them physically safe um, at the risk of their emotional and mental health. Um, we are really well aware of that. It's been a terrible algorithm and a terrible risk to assess throughout this pandemic. You know, there are conversations that we have with facilities that are as specific as, okay, you've got 14 residents. Can you keep 12 on, the, on your two floors in your room while staff are walking one person at a time out of their room so that they can get some exercise, can get some movement, can get some air that's not you know, just in their space? It, it is, um, it's heartbreaking. And it's heartbreaking for the staff that are watching this happen. You know, I, I, I will share with this committee that over the course of this time, my daughter has been working in a long-term care facility in White River Junction. And just seeing this through her eyes has been incredibly powerful um, and inc incredibly profound, just kind of what the staff are up against and what they're trying to do to care for people at, throughout this and to take care of themselves. I mean, she's 19, she's young, she's resilient, but you know, this is hard. Um, and it's hard in terms of what we've also asked staff to do because they are not sometimes going home to their families. You know, they are staying in hotels if there's an outbreak in their facility. They are camping out on the floor in the facility. They are in trailers in the backyard because they want to be able to care for their, their residents and they don't want to risk their families. So the uh, impact has been so global and it's really across residents, staff, and the families of residents who are feeling really powerless and really disconnected and really like they aren't fulfilling their obligations as family members to the people that they love the most. I, I, you know, I could go, I could talk about this really all day because it's just been incredible to see and to be part of. Um, but, and I don't think I've talked to you about any of the impacts that you already don't know about, to be honest with you, because you've been talking about this as a committee the whole time. I think representative Jail is talking or I'm not sure. Um, no, okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sorry, I'm also at work and I have to occasionally. <laughs> yeah, got it. So shall I, shall I keep moving through? I know you had a few other topic areas for me, but, but this one I can go on. I feel like I step behind a pulpit when I start talking about this. No, um, I, I appreciate that. Um, Probably yes to um, move on um, because we and because I also want to. I mean, it is a, it's not even ten thirty, but I also want to give enough time to um, our other uh, witnesses. Um, 
but I thought it was appropriate to start with you and the commissioner as the commissioner. Okay. Great. So let me talk with you just a little bit about adult days and, and it will be the same um, kind of rhapsodizing about our community partners. Um, adult day programs have been in a really unique position throughout this throughout this pandemic. And again, we talked about it a little bit yesterday, the fact that from a funding perspective, what we realized really early on was that they were gonna need um, support. And actually what you all realized early on was that they were gonna need support because in March, um, we asked them to close down. We realized that the, the nature of an adult day program as it has typically run is that it is a congregate setting um, it provides, you know, respite supports for families who have individuals living with them at home, but it also provides kind of socialization and connection for their participants, in addition to personal care and medical procedures. I mean, it is a full service kind of a facility, an adult day program. And considering who was most at risk for a COVID um, infection and the level of care that's provided at an adult day program, there was no way that we could figure out with them um, and thinking, looking at the science and the data, how to keep people in those settings state, safe and how to keep the staff safe. So they were asked in March to close down fully um, and the healthcare stabilization fund was available to them to apply for, but more specifically, there was money appropriated through the legislature and put into the Dale budget that supported them fully um, for all of their operational costs, two different tranches of funding, July through September and uh, October through December. So, so two quarters of full operational funding to enable them to stay closed, but not to lose their buildings, not to lose their staff, to be, to be there kind of at the end of this, to be able to reopen um, and support individuals when that became safe. We did some planning with them at the very end of the summer, when we thought that they were gonna be able to reopen at least partially um, with physical distance and, and at a reduced census. Um, and just as we were ready to, um, to launch that, and if you had actually started again, the second wave hit and we realized that we needed to pull back. Um, so they have been closed physically all of this time, but they have been delivering um, services throughout in terms of, of, of online connection, um, groups. I had, we had a great presentation or a great conversation with the Adult Days uh, last week. And one of the programs was just talking about 40 people in a Zoom meeting doing classes um, and how they had arrayed their staff so that one staff was leading and other staff were paying attention to all of the of the videos and if somebody started to have a coughing fit, they would go offline and check in with that person on the phone individually, checking in for, for comprehension and attention. I mean, it was, a, it, was, it was extraordinary what they were able to do online to keep people connected. Um, so from a Dale perspective, you know, we worked really hard to make sure that they had flexibility in their billing so that they could bill for telehealth, which has been a huge, um, an interesting silver lining to this pandemic that I think we don't want to lose as we go forward because we've made some progress there with Medicaid, not with Medicare, um, but with Medicaid at least to really be able to build telehealth, which has been great. And beyond telehealth to build some of the companionship and, and activity hours one-on-one -on -one, um, to be able to build for those as well, which has been wonderful. Um, <clears throat> we're also looking at trying to create strategies to build for those group rates a little bit more effectively so that people can stay connected. Um, none of that replaces the physical care that still needs to happen through adult days and none of it fully replaces the respite that is so critical for families who are caregivers. Um, and I know, again, we've talked about it in this committee many, many times, the value and, and the profound numbers of unpaid caregivers across the state of Vermont is is mind blowing. And when you look at the actual numbers and the, and the financial impact of those unpaid hours, we, you know, it's easy to see clearly that the system could never sustain that at a paid level. And so it's, it's important that we continue to support those unpaid caregivers. And that's one of the most significant um, components of the adult day programs. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know that I have a lot more to say about that. I know that you've got a couple of folks on the phone to talk 
or on the screen to talk later. But if there are any questions from a Dale perspective about adult days, I can answer those and then pop on to talk a little bit more about um, abuse and exploitation. Um, thank you, Commissioner. Um, you will continue to be in the room, as they say, so why don't you move forward? Okay. Um, and then, um, <clears throat> uh, actually, committee, and I'm sort of like also thinking about the uh, folks who are here to testify. Um, potentially, um, if there are brief co um, questions, not comments, but questions um, for uh, the commissioner, and then as each person goes, um, and then we may circle back with more questions. Um, go ahead, Commissioner. Okay. So the next topic is, um, I feel like I'm a little all over the map here, but it, it gives you some grounding. Um, one of the questions that Chairwoman Pugh asked me to just talk very briefly about was the impact of COVID-19 on um, uh, abuse and financial exploitation for our vulnerable Vermonters. So part of the department is our division of licensing and protection, which is our survey and certification unit. So those nurses that I talked about as part of the rapid response team earlier on are surveyors, um, but also adult protective services sits in the department. Um, and so we have been obviously paying attention to adult abuse and neglect and exploitation throughout this pandemic. Um, and we knew as this pandemic started ramping up, as was true nationally, um, that there was going to be a huge impact on reporting as, 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 the, as the world kind of locked down. Um, we anticipated that we would see less reporting. Um, and that is in fact proven true. And I have just a little bit of data to share with you. Um, but so we knew that that was a potential, um, that that's a typical response and that we were worried and we were worried, right? Because people are much more isolated and you don't know what you don't know. And if you're not getting those reports, it really puts people at risk. And, and just as a side note, you know, I, I think we've all seen the data about domestic abuse, right? That really increased through the pandemic, but was reported less, prosecuted less because people were stuck in situations and couldn't get out. So you think about domestic abuse and it obviously pertains as well to individuals that might be living with families and situations that are highly stressed and highly fraught and, and much more problematic than they were when everybody was moving about more normally. So this was something that we were paying attention to and we're really worried about quite frankly. So what we did was just to get prepared for this and, and it would be great I think uh, in the future to bring um, licensing and protection in to talk with you a little bit more specifically. And I believe that you received either yesterday or today a, a report from Adult Protective Services with a, a whole lot of data points um, for you to look at. And so that might be something worth talking about into the future. But looking at nine months of COVID from April through December of 2020, so that's a nine month period. We compared that same nine month period to 2019 and 2018, just to give us a little bit of perspective and a little bit of, of trend information. Um, so with that information, looking at the 2020 data, we know that reports through this COVID pandemic have gone down about 13%. Um, and the ability to complete investigations has gone down about 32%. So just looking at our intakes, in 2019, we had 2879, and in 2020, we had 2516. So we know that we were hearing less from people, um, but with all of that said, the recommendation for substantiations has gone up to 18%, from 13% to 18%. So if we look at the data, and you can look at data so many different ways, but for us, what we really believe is that the most serious abuses were still being were still being reported because the rate of substantiation was so much higher. Um, so we were seeing things that were much more clear. That is my hope. That's my hope that that's what the data means um, because 
anything else is sort of untenable. But so I'd like to believe that we were catching the worst things and people were still reporting them. Um, I will say that we also, um, just in terms of breakout, it was abuse was at about 25%, neglect was at about 25%, and exploitation was about 50% of our, of our investigations over that same time period. Um, so again, that's a little bit of a shift, but I know we've seen more and more financial exploitation um, over the course of the last few years, and it's something that we've talked about as a group a couple of different times. To counteract what we knew was gonna be a problem, with, um, with this reporting through the pandemic, we did have a pretty aggressive approach to outreach. Um, so we worked with inventory, we worked with community partners to make sure that they knew how to report that we were still functioning, even if investigators were functioning and investigating in different ways. We developed a one page outreach, outreach, outreach document that we distributed throughout that whole provider community to again remind them just because the state is, is, is working remotely doesn't mean that our investigations aren't still happening, doesn't mean that investigators aren't still going out. We got all of our investigators fit tested and got them PPE early on. So when they were going out, they looked a little bit like spacemen, but they were going out still um, and interviewing people on their front porches and their front yards, you know, trying to do it as safely as possible, but not, not neglecting or walking away from that responsibility. We also developed a PSA in conjunction with Family Services with their um, Child Protection Registry Group because we the same sort of an impact in reporting was happening in child abuse and prevention. Um, so we developed a PSA and it got about 550 radio spots um, throughout the height of the pandemic so that people could continue to hear, we want you to still report, we're still here to get reports, this is really critical. Um, we moved our, um, our training for abuse neglect and exploitation reporting online so that we could push it out to more organizations more quickly and they didn't have to physically come in to be trained. Um, talked to a lot of community partners um, and worked with a specific interagency team in the Windsor area um, that was part of an elder justice grant. So again, tried to be very aggressive and remind people that we were here um, working, taking calls, and again, even now investigators are going out in full PPE to collect reports if that's necessary. Um, so just a little bit of information, again, that you should have received a report either yesterday or today. I think it was due today. I think we actually got it in yesterday. Um, and that has a lot, a lot more data points in it. Um, that actually is based on, as you will all recall, the Older Vermonters Act that was passed last session um, the adult abuse registry was required to submit a report for many years. That requirement sunset. We continued to submit a report, but the Older Vermonters Act codified that that would be an annual report that the legislature would receive. And this was the first newly revised version of that report. So I have just one more topic. Should I jump right into it and give you a little bit of a framework about transfer of ownership or is this too much for right now? I think um, this is enough for right now. How's that? Um, and partially because uh, we do have folks um, who were in the field who are um, or representing folks who were in the field to give us um, some testimony, both um, in terms of um, what the experience, but more what we've learned. And what, if we're going to be, there's a, we're in the middle of an, another surge and we it's going to be for a while. Um, what do we need to keep doing? What do we need to do differently? Um, so yep. uh, I will move on and thank you. If you would stay, we would appreciate that. Absolutely. Um, but before I um, ask Sean Lonegan, the long-term care, Ombudsman, um, to testify, I want to make sure that there's no um, question right now from any of the uh, committee members. Okay, thank you. Thank you, um, Commissioner. Um, uh, Teresa's got her hand up, Madam Chair. Oh, she does. Why can't I see it? Okay, uh, Sean, if you could wait for a second. Um, uh, uh, 
Representative Wood, I did not see your hand. I apologize. That's okay, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, Commissioner, thank you so much, um, not only for being here, but for the leadership that you've provided um, with the department and all of your staff. Um, and I totally agree with you when you talk about relationships, meaning everything when you're in a crisis. So um, thank you so much. I just have really one quick question. And um, I did take a look at the, um, the report that we did receive yesterday and thank you for that. And um, I have a lot of questions there, but I'm gonna leave that for another day. Um, for, de for today, I just wanted to um, double check on, um, on two things. Um, first, I heard you say about the 40 people that are contracted via TLC. And um, it sounded like that, that um, facilities contact you and then you contact TLC and they, um, they go out, you know, that you're, you're the, the hub there in terms of getting them out. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, excuse me, I'm going to be alphabet soup. TLC. Oh, uh, TLC is, uh, I don't know if it's tender. That, that's juice. actually literally their name. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what it stands for. It's, uh, so uh, TLC is a, is a non-medical non uh, provider, essentially. They, so they are, you can contract with them directly to provide home care, um, but they are able to uh, hire RNs and LPNs although it's challenging to get any RNs and LPNs in the state right now, but they have, uh, they have travelers actually coming in from other parts of the country that are just here in Vermont and working for them directly. Um, so they are a sort of a staffing agency. Thank you. Tender loving care. <laughs> and, and this is a unprecedented, I might add. So, um, you know, the fact that the, you know, that we're contracting out with non-Medicaid providers for, these kinds of services is um, uh, creative. I, I hats off for seeing a problem and figuring out how to solve it. I just was wanting to see how that worked in terms of facilities. Then my, my second question really has to do with adult days. And I think we'll probably maybe take additional testimony uh, at some further point about that. But um, the, the payments lasted through December and we know we're in the middle of a surge right now and it, it seems to be going to be lasting for a while. Um, could, can you um, describe what kind of assistance the department is providing between now and say June 30th in terms of flexibility in billing or I, I know that the COVID money right now, the, the um, CARES money has been allocated. Um, uh, and we don't exactly know what's going to happen with the second round, but um, so just what kind of flexibility and how are you working with them since we've lost three of them, I think, to date so far? Um, yes. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you're absolutely right in that the, the CRF funding that was available at, at this point is uh, that original tranche of dollars is is spent out. I think we're all waiting to see what will happen with the federal government. My understanding is that that money, that the next round of relief is not designed in the same way as the original one was in, in that we might not be able to, as a state, to decide how to use it and allocate it out. Um, there is a little bit, and I'm sure that the folks that are here will testify to it, but there is about $150,000 more or less um, left from what was allocated out to the adult day programs. They are obligated to account to us and to give us information about what they've spent about those two tranches of dollars. So there's a little bit left. Um, and I think it's not yet clear if that can be carried forward, um, but it's just a, it's a very small amount, obviously. Um, and then beyond that, it's trying to really develop the, the billing flexibilities that we've talked about. So enabling them to bill when they are delivering services, you know, electronically on the phone, over video, trying to build them towards a group rate that they can also access. Um, but that's not, that will not sustain them. I mean, just to be very direct and candid, that is a portion of what they could do and bill, but that will definitely not sustain them fully. Um, it is also, I will say that the pandemic, it has its own silver linings and it is um, 
pushing ahead a conversation that we've wanted to have about payment reform with the adult day programs because going into the future, their billing structure is really very fee for service. And I don't think that that's something that can be sustained. Uh, it, you know, just imagine any kind of a program where you're sending a family member, but with adult day, if somebody doesn't walk in the door, the adult day cannot bill for that person, even though they are holding their spot they have staffing available. So when they do open up again, I think that the payment structure is something that we have to look at. We've talked about that a lot, but this has really forced our thank hand. Thank you. Commissioner, thank you. That is identifying perhaps something that we in fact can, can do differently or um, focus on as we move forward. Um, thank you very much. And I'm now going to turn this over to um, Sean Lonergan, who is our long-term care ombudsman out of legal aid. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Chairperson, and thank you, Committee, for um, um, allowing me to come in and, and speak to you uh, today. Um, and again, I, I know some people, and I don't know other people, so I guess the first thing I would say was, um, I will be, uh, we, similar to um, 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 Commissioner Hutt, we submitted our report to the legislature, um, our annual report, so the 15, so I said, I I'm going to be kind of um, going from that report because uh, okay. of today uh, as I'm speaking. So if you have that, um, I guess, or if you miss anything, you can you can refer to that. Um, and first, and uh, uh, Sean, um, Sean um, you don't need to um, rep uh, summarize the entire report. Um, right. One one what would be probably helpful is a very brief description as to who and what the long-term care ombudsman is. Okay. <laughs> and what you, you know, and then, um, which is probably in the report, which is um, on, for anyone who is looking, it's on our committee's webpage, if they wanna um, do that. Um, and we are focused um, on COVID, not on other kinds of things. We're, we're focused okay. on COVID. Okay. Yeah, so the long-term care ombudsman project, <laughs> Um, we're part of legal aid. So uh, I guess the first point I would just want to make is we're not part of the state government. Um, we're independent and um, each state has their own um, uh, long-term care ombudsman project. Vermont's, uh, and it can be all different. Vermont's different in the sense that we're not part of the um, uh, state government. We're in Vermont legal aid. And what the VOP are, is, is we're advocates um, and resources for individuals at living in long-term care facilities and also individuals get, uh, who are participating with choices for care in the community. Um, so we work with nursing home residents, uh, residential care residents, and residents of assisted living um, uh, facilities. And we also, in the, so that, and then we, so we work with people in long-term care facilities, and then also any individuals who are receiving choices for care um, in the community. So those are primarily individuals who, um, uh, work, I mean, work, uh, live um, in home and get um, their services living at home. Um, and we do a number of, of, of um, we have a number of responsibilities and duty, but primarily what we do is uh, if individuals, residents that I talked about or choice of care participants have concerns or issues about the care that they're receiving, we assist those individuals with trying to resolve those problems or issues and we can do that generally, uh, like a more of an informal uh, way in which we just kind of talk to maybe a facility at the staff and we could do it more formally um, by helping residents and uh, recipients of Choices for Care actual file, file complaints, um, you know, and with the state. And that would be a complaint to the survey and certification. Um, and that's how it potentially get, get revolved. So we do um, things uh, informally and formally, but we're resident directed. So we only do things that the resident um, tells us uh, that they want to, to, uh, to be done. Um, so those, those are kind of a general, general overview of what the VOP um, is and what we do. And so um, I guess I would just, our, our in, um, if I'm just gonna skip to th through um, the report in the sense of uh, our, our report talks about complaints um, and cases, and you could look at those categories. Um, and I guess 
the point here, I guess, if when in reading the report, um, I think there's things that you could focus on during a time of COVID, right? Um, so if I was going to be short and succinct and focus on um, what um, you've asked for, um, first, you might want to look at page seven, because I'm, excuse me, um, section seven, which is on page uh, 12 of the report, because that kind of describes some of the casework that ombudsmen have worked on during this um, past year. And so that will give you a flavor of some of the things or issues that residents have experienced during this past year. And some of those things will be COVID related. Some of those things won't be, but it's really hard to kind of tease out um, given the fact that COVID has actually impacted everything. But that will give you an idea of what residents and participants are, are facing um, over the past, or in the sense of describing their experiences. And also in the report, we talk about what we would uh, do is, is, as we seeing the major issues um, facing residents and CFC participants um, at this point. And that's in section 12 and it's issues and recommendations and it starts on page uh, 17. And so one of our, our first issue is that, and uh, Commissioner Hush had mentioned this in the sense of you know, cases and deaths in nursing homes and um, the degree to which COVID has impacted um, residents of long-term care um, facilities has been you know, documented and shown in the sense that um, early on in the pandemic, um, that, that was the, a hot spot. And um, I would agree with Commissioner Hutt that Vermont in comparison to other states so I, as a state long-term care ombudsman, I participate on calls, um, nationwide calls. And given the lack of leadership from the federal government, it's kind of been, in my view, each state kind of doing their own thing and trying to muddle their way through this. And in comparison to other states, um, Vermont's, um, <clears throat> the impact on residents and long-term care has been better in the sense that while Vermont has obviously had deaths um, and cases in long-term care facilities, I, I would just say that th those numbers are, are, haven't been as drastic as other states. For example, in um, neighboring states of New York, Massachusetts, and New Jersey in the spring when the, during the first surge, um, there were the, the stories that I was, was hearing about um, nursing homes and long-term care facilities um, was very frightening. And I do um, agree with Commissioner Hutt that um, if, if you're comparing Vermont to other states, um, Vermont's done, the state government has done a, a, a very good job um, with COVID and, and nursing homes. So um, <clears throat> I, I would just want to emphasize the point um, that we, and I, think I, and I have no indication this is, this is going to occur or happen, but we just need to be still, um, like not let our, our guard down because the epidemiology of, of COVID you know, has not changed um, as we've seen with the second surge. So, you know, nursing home residents, residents of long-term care facilities aren't at any less risk, you know, despite the improvements that we've seen in, you know, testing and surveillance, and now we have vaccines. Um, we just don't want to let our, um, our, our, our guard down. Um, so that would be one of our issues is this, just the fact that, and, and Vermont has, has been very proactive um, and you've seen it with the vaccines in the sense that, um, you know, a nursing home residents and residents of long-term care are within that first phase of, of getting vaccinations. Um, so we just want, again, not to let our, our guard down and realize that, um, you know, it's still a time of, of great risks um, uh, for individuals living in long-term care facilities. The second issue um, that we, we pointed out in our report is just staffing shortages at you know, long-term care facilities and home health agencies. And, you know, inadequate staffing has been an issue even before COVID. And those staffing issues have just become, you know, more magnified and exasperated um, by COVID. And so, you know, the, the long-term care ombudsman, uh, we, we would just wanna, we would obviously, um, and, and why this is important, why staffing is important is because staffing you know, is directly related to the quality of care and the care uh, the services that individuals um, receive. 
So, you know, when there's inadequate staffing, that means that residents um, and part CFC participants, you know, are gonna bear that in the sense of having less services, the quality of care will be less. So, you know, staffing obviously is very, very important. So, you know, Vermont, and I know that the state's working on this and, and, and people all are very concerned on it, but we, we need to explore ways um, to, to try to, you know, bolster us, us um, staffing and make sure that staffing meets the needs of individuals seeking long-term care in, in, in facilities and through choices of a care. And maybe that's through um, pay, pay increases um, because most people that work in this field, long-term care services, particularly AIDS, don't make a good living. They don't get a good wage. So, you know, that would be w one area to look at. And, uh, you know, and this has been talked about too before, we, some way to maybe realign Medicaid payments to providers <clears throat> so that the, the actual cost of providing services um, um, is, is, act, is, is closer to the actual costs. Um, Medicaid all, traditionally pays at a lower rate. Um, so it just makes things much more difficult for providers to, to, the, to meet the need. Um, and so, and again, you can read through the recommendations, a number of recommendations. Um, I don't wanna uh, take up time going through each one of those, um, but again, staffing, inadequate staffing in facilities and in the community. <clears throat> I would like to emphasize that in the community, um, again, that's been exasperated by, um, by COVID. So um, we've had during the past, uh, you know, once the, after the pandemic, um, we, and during the pandemic, um, we've heard uh, many, many stories of, uh, from uh, reports from uh, recipients that their care plan needs, our, our care service hours when they live in the community just are being filled um, for various reasons. And it usually goes back to staffing um, and that's becoming a bigger and bigger problem. <clears throat> the third issue that we identified is uh, social is isolation and loneliness. Uh, and again, I, this is not something that people aren't saying is an issue, um, but the fact that, the, and it's very hard to deal with it given the nature of COVID and particularly in, in long-term care residents where the risk is so high and the, you know, and if a person does get COVID, um, it, it's more than likely gonna lead to, you know, really bad um, <laughs> outcomes. Um, uh, it's really, really hard. It's, there's no easy choices here. Um, but I, I just do, and I, I would say that the state and actually the federal government has, has heard and has recognized um, that social isolation and loneliness due to COVID and the restrictions and the lockdowns are having a significant impact on residents and uh, have attempted to try to um, you know, rectify that problem, address that problem as best they can. Um, but I just think that going forward, it needs to be kept in, in mind. And I'm not saying that, no one, no, that people aren't keeping in mind because if you look at the state guidance, <laughs> over time it's transformed or, or um, evolved, um, whereby they've had, you know, where visits are taking place, right? There was a lockdown initially during this um, uh, late summer, I mean, early summer, late summer visitation started, outdoor visitation started. And then in October, there was guidance issued from CMS for nursing homes in regard to indoor visitation, which ba and it basically said that indoor visitation should take place um, as long as, uh, unless there's a valid safety or clinical reason for why it shouldn't. And the state of Vermont evolved <laughs> their guidance um, to facilities to match that. Um, and then we had a second surge. So again, I just wanna point out that P residents are experiencing isolation. They are reporting loneliness and it has an impact on their mental and health, um, but it's really, really hard to try to figure out how to go forward. And I, I guess the best thing from our perspective is that residents need to be heard in terms of their experience. And then hopefully, um, uh, and, and I guess it's been my experience based on what I've seen in terms of guidance that you know, the experts on how to navigate um, safely um, residents through this, you know, like through a, um, a public health uh, perspective, 
you know, have listened to that and tried to do the best they can, but there's times when, uh, you know, that there has to be lockdowns or they ha there are times when, you know, visitation has to be restricted and it's kind of a constant pull and, and push. Um, and I guess the important thing is just to be in a situation or to reevaluate um, that guidance around visitation, for example, as regularly as possible. And the state has, you know, has done that. And so then the last issue. Um, um, excuse me, Sean. Sure. I'm, um, as you are talking, I actually have pulled up the report and I'm, it's, um, it's a very thorough report. Thank you. Um, as you're talking, and I just want to point this out and maybe we will um, look at the whole report at another time more closely. Um, you have a very specific recommendation that Vermont should ensure that long-term care facilities provide residents, no, um, should provide residents with reliable, regular access to communication technology, along with assistance to use whatever technology is available and works best for the resident. Right. And so <clears throat> I'm thinking that that must be not just phone, but also whether it's things like iPads or computers or whatever, so that you can have some kind of face-to-face -face yep. communication. Yes. And um, that may be something that we need to measure. That may be something that needs to be part of a checklist. I mean, so those are the kinds of things to look at as we continue. Right, and, and facilities. Um, again, from my experience, have been doing the best they can. Like, and like all of us, you know, sometimes um, we do really good things and sometimes, you know, we don't. So facilities have tried and I, yeah, so I guess that's, I think that's an important point to try to get an idea of how much, how to the degree uh, this has actually happened across the board. You know what I mean? Um, so you, of course, yeah, there's instances where this is happening and facilities mm -hmm. are probably doing as best as they can, but it would be right. good to have an actual data to, to, to determine. If Exactly. If these are recommendations, despite Correct. the fact that people are doing the best that they can, it's important that we have a picture of what they're actually doing. Correct. Right. So that's a great way of putting it. And then, um, so then um, uh, the last recommendation is just quality of care. And again, um, you know, COVID and rightfully so has taken you know, everybody's preoccupied with, uh, you know, focused on, on, on COVID, um, um, but other things are still happening. Um, and so, um, and that's uh, the, 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 the focus on COVID, you know, does trickle down and um, it, it impacts, um, you know, um, your quality of care. And I guess things are probably even um, more magnified because, you know, friends, families, um, and concerned persons haven't had the same access to, for example, residents um, of long-term care facilities that they have in the past. So there's questions in everybody's mind about the quality of care that individuals are, are you know, are receiving. And we've received enough complaints or, or calls um, from either residents or, um, you know, concerned persons to realize that, you know, quality of care um, is an issue. Um, and again, we have specific um, recommendations around there. And um, I, I do I remember uh, at the beginning um, the talk about the, the nursing home oversight committee, um, which did have you know some recommendations, um, um, particularly along like enhanced um, licensing uh, process uh, for transfers of sales of own, um, nursing homes. So again, there there and there was actually um, there. Um, uh, I'm sure the committee remembers this, the fact that um, Dale was rewriting the regulations for residential care homes and assisted living residents. So I, I know um, I, everybody's again, doing the best they can, but there are other things um, that were going on prior to COVID. And I just don't, I guess we put this recommendations in, not just so we, as a kind of, don't forget about those other things that would impact quality of care for residents. Um, so, Again, those are specific re recommendations. And um, I apologize for talking fast. I know I always talk fast, um, but I guess those are the points that I think are, are, um, are important to uh, hit upon at this time. And if anybody ever has any questions about the report um, or wants any um, you know, 
follow up, I, I can certainly do that. Um, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, I want to check and see if there are uh, questions right now and ask you um, if you are able to, to stay through the, for the next, um, in case there's an ultimate question at the end. Are you sure. able to do that? Yep, I can uh, do that. And, I, and one other thing, I just want to say that I agree with Monica in the sense of Vermont, um, uh, the, the state's response. And I do think, <clears throat> yes, size has helped, but it's also a reflection of the leadership um, here in Vermont. And it's, from my uh, perspective, it's been proactive um, and it actually has tried to res it has respond, respond in the sense of it's revised and it's always looking to try to do things better. So I do think that, you know, from the uh, leadership in Vermont should be commended for their, you know, efforts uh, with COVID. Well, thank you. Are there um, uh, questions for, um, for Sean? Okay. Um, <clears throat> Sean, thank you very much. I appreciate, um, I appreciate that. And um, I, <clears throat> my computer has just lost my uh, agenda. Um, Laura Pelosi is up next, Madam Chair. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> Laura. Um, Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, uh, Laura Pelosi, and I represent the Vermont Healthcare Association, which is the trade association for our long-term care facilities. So for those of you who are new, I guess we'll just keep repeating that it's the SNFs slash nursing home, so skilled nursing facility slash nursing home, residential care home, and assisted living uh, residences or facilities. Uh, thank you so much for having me here this morning. Uh, this has just been an incredible 10 months. I think we're in, I think we're in month 10. Um, but certainly the world went topsy-turvy back in March um, and things have just simply not been the same. And I would say, you know, the impact on long-term care facility residents and staff has been incredibly significant as you've heard from both Commissioner Hutt and from, from Sean Londrigan. Um, and I will just echo, I meet regularly with my peers across the country. And there is little doubt that we have had a very different experience here in Vermont. You know, my peers across the country can't just pick up the phone and get the commissioner, you know, immediately, can't get to Dr. Levine immediately. Um, they don't have organized Zoom meetings like we do with representatives from, you know, 200 facilities, representatives from Dale, representatives from D BDH, all on a Zoom, like raising issues, asking questions, walking through new guidance, um, getting technical assistance. I mean, we are doing that on a very regular basis and that's just not happening in other places. Uh, I think uh, that's a real you know, testament and a real key um, component to the success that we have had despite some tragedy. Um, I, I wanna give a little bit more nuance to the the description that the commissioner gave with respect to the facilities and just to, to make sure folks understand that at the SNF or nursing home level, one of the big differences there is that they have really two populations that they serve. So they provide a traditional long-term care service. Um, these days with our Choices for Care program having been extremely successful in allowing individuals to receive their care at home for as long as possible. The acuity level of a long-term care patient in a, in a nursing home is, is quite high. Um, they tend to have uh, multiple medical conditions and comorbidities. Think somebody who might be on di dialysis or have COPD, just very, very high medically complex folks. But then they also provide a short stay service under Medicare. So that's your 30 or 60 days uh, recovering from a, you know, that classic knee or hip replacement or you've had a severe infection or a cardiac event and you need some skilled nursing care or you need PT, OT, speech and language therapy for some period of time before you can transition home or back to your residential care home or assisted living. So that acuity is high and that's been one of the extreme risk factors in particular at the SNF level. And I would echo um, the commissioner's comments with respect to our concerns from the very beginning about residential care homes and assisted living and 
their capacity to manage through this pandemic due to the different types of staffing. They don't have um, heavy clinical staffing. Um, they have much less staffing. They're organized very differently. So we've been very concerned about their capacity. And as an association and in working with Dale and VDH, I think we've done a good job of trying to make sure they have the resources they need, peer support, um, all, of, all of those things. Um, if I just back up a little bit to March, and, and I do want to talk about the challenges and some of the gaps that we're seeing, because I, I think you're particularly interested in that, and it's very important for us as well. But as we go back to March, as we were watching what was happening in the state of Washington, which is where the very first sniff was really overtaken by this virus, um, you know, facilities in our state started really trying to beef up their stocks of PPE and supplies, which was nearly impossible due to the shortage of those supplies and just the exorbitant costs. They also at that time had already begun screening for symptoms for their residents and for their staff. Um, and then at that, you know, at that point in time, there was really no guidance. When the governor declared his state of emergency, facilities were shut down to visitation, to non-essential personnel. They continued and beef, beefed up that symptom screening. This was before we had testing available. They had to halt communal activities within those facilities. I'm talking uh, nursing homes, residential care, assisted living. So that would be anything like communal dining, social activities, all of that really stopped. Um, you know, they moved to, to Sean's point, visitation remotely via, you know, Zoom, WhatsApp, FaceTime, standard phone call, window visits, you know, facilities were creating spaces so that, you know, their loved one could come, you know, and visit them outside or maybe, maybe be in the vestibule with the um, resident in the lobby so that they could see one another. It really, you know, depended on the resident's abilities to interact and what the best medium was and what the facility had access to. There were some grant funds that facilities applied for and received so that they could, you know, add iPads and Chromebooks to their stockpile. Um, certainly not, you know, not every resident, uh, he or she is, a, is, a, is equipped with one, but the facility um, was able to um, increase the number of devices that they had so that they could work with families to schedule um, remote visits. It's, it's been very challenging and the, the visitation piece in particular. And during the limited window where we started to do outdoor visitation over the summer, um, you know, we pushed as an association really hard to allow that to occur. Um, it was logistically very complicated because you still had to ensure appropriate social distancing, masking, but the facilities really felt that that was critical to the emotional uh, health of their residents. So they worked really hard to get that up and running. And then we, for a limited period of time, had moved to that indoor visitation, which similarly was challenging and very scary on some level for facilities. You know, it's this like benefit, this, this cost benefit that they're going through all the time where they know they need to do it because it's the best thing for the residents and they do everything in their power to make sure that they are controlling that risk of exposure as well. So, so I think facilities have worked really hard um, to, to maintain that connection in a really challenging time, but you know, they recognize how incredibly important that is. Um, you know, the SNFs in particular uh, upgraded as much as they possibly could their ventilation systems because we know that the ventilation within any given space is really challenging. Negative pressure rooms, not so much. There's not a lot of capability to do that. Um, the, the infrastructure and the capital costs associated with that was um, prohibitive. You know, new admissions into a long-term care facility have to quarantine for 14 days. That's really tough. It's really tough on the staffing. It requires even more staff than we normally have to have. The amount, the, the types and the quantities of PPE that facilities are going through is, is not like you would see in the normal ordinary course of running a long-term care facility. And the state has been a great partner in making sure that when we have a gap, and we can't get those supplies and that PPE that they come to the plate and they they help us procure that. It's been a, it's been a great partnership. On the testing piece, that has evolved with the science and the availability of new types of tests. You know, it started where you know testing was only happening in the outbreak scenario back in the spring. Um, then we really pushed, and, and VDH was phenomenal on this, once the first CDC data came out at the end of March about what happened in the state of Washington, 
and they realized that asymptomatic transmission in long-term care facilities was a huge issue. Um, that's when we started uh, making sure we could get um, patients being discharged from the hospital to a long-term care facility tested before they came to the facility. And that combined with the quarantine requirements, you know, really helped to reduce the risk of exposure in the building. Uh, now we are up to regular surveillance. You know, nursing homes are doing daily antigen testing, all shifts, plus once a week PCR testing. Our residential care homes and assisted living are doing twice a week PCR. And this is, it's administratively and logistically incredibly challenging. And every single one of those test results gets reported to the federal and state government. So just the time and the staffing that it takes. But what I will tell you is they're so committed to it because that's how they're catching cases. And it's been very effective that way. So as much of the, as much as it's adding to that workload, they're doing it and they're very committed to it and very passionate about it. They get really concerned if, if we're getting low on testing supplies, you know, whatever the scenario is, um, they get really concerned about making sure they can continue to do that. And the state has been a great partner in making sure they have access to what they need to continue to do that testing. Um, and, and what I would say now is we're deeply into the vaccine deployment phase. Um, thankfully, there's light at the end of the tunnel. I think this is going to take months and months. Um, but I, I probably spend, you know, I feel like five hours a day. Uh, I'm sure the commissioner does more than that just on vaccine deployment these days. Um, but, you know, the facilities are all signed up for their clinics. We're working through a lot of the logistics. And I did just want to comment. I heard Dr. Levine's comments um, to the joint committees the other day about the uptake of vaccines or vaccine hesitancy with long-term care facility staff. Um, I just want to say I think it's too early for any concern. Anecdotally, what I hear um, and, and maybe the commissioner could verify, but we're seeing anywhere from like a, around 50 percent to as high as 90 percent uptake but we've only had one clinic. There are multiple clinics scheduled. Facilities made some conscious choices to, to stagger staff in case of staff reactions so that they didn't have a lot of staff maybe calling out for one or two days because of the staffing problem that we have. And then some staff wanted to wait for that second clinic just to see how their peers might have done um, who went in the first clinic. So, so I would say it's too soon um, to, to fear that we're not gonna have good uptake of the vaccine in long-term care facilities. With regard to challenges um, and opportunities or gaps, um, what I would say is that the sheer volume of guidance and the rapid, rapid pace at which it changes at the CDC level, at the VDH level, at the Dale level, that has been an incredible challenge. And again, thanks to the relationships and our ability to get the people we need to talk to on a Zoom with all the facilities answering questions, because every time a new guidance comes out, they have to modify their policies and their protocols. Um, so that has really helped to at least, you know, kind of get folks, get their heads around the issue and be able to implement. And, and I think that's been key and that has happened always very quickly when new guidance comes out we get those Zooms going you know, right away. And I think that's been super helpful. And I appreciate both the commissioner and um, Sean's focus on perhaps one of our, if not the biggest challenge, staffing, staffing, staffing. Um, and this was our primary um, issue before the pandemic. You know, uh, last session we came in ha having, I, I chaired the Rural Health Services uh, Workforce Task Force. Um, we submitted a report. The legislature took a lot of steps last year to help us in particular with that nursing shortage. There are some more things to be done, but we knew before the pandemic, we were in a terrible situation with staffing and that has been exacerbated. Facilities need even more staff than they did pre-pandemic, even with lower numbers of residents in the building. And that's because it takes more staff to do all of the things that have to be done in terms of infection control, um, it takes any staff person much more time to complete a task because they have to don and doff PPE between every activity and every interaction. Um, you know, staff are out because they're either exposed or they're positive themselves. Um, fear, fatigue is a real issue. Ten, you know, 10 months into this, excuse me. <clears throat> 
And then, you know, you heard the commissioner with respect, I think we all have fatigue. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> with respect to the uh, impact on staffing in an outbreak. We had relied very heavily, you know, pre pandemic on the traveling nurse population. They simply don't exist these days. They exist, but they're deployed everywhere else in the country that is experiencing a terrible, terrible, you know, outbreak with this virus. So to the extent we can get them, they're almost cost prohibitive. And we've had to work with Dale um, and, you know, a couple of facilities just to try to bring some, you know, traveler resources so that they could, you know, take more admissions from hospitals, for example. So those costs are real and we've really appreciated the funding that um, the legislature has made available for these facilities. Um, you know, we, nationally, you know, the numbers I see is that there's an expectation that 40 to 60% of long-term care facilities, um, you know, might close in this next year because of the impacts of the pandemic. I think because Vermont has done such a good job with trying to provide financial support and because we've had direct federal funding come into all levels of our long-term care facilities. Hopefully that's not the situation that we will see uh, here in Vermont, but it's, it's, you know, it's precarious, I will say. I think the limitations with our infrastructure has been really challenging. These are old buildings that were built, you know, uh, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, they were intended to have multi-occupancy rooms, shared bathrooms, you know, open spaces. So if you think about it, I don't know how many of you had the opportunity to attend um, um, a legislative event that the healthcare providers had done. And one of our administrators uh, from Birchwood Terrace in Burlington, who was the second facility to experience an outbreak, you know, she told the story there. They had to move their dietary services, their housekeeping services outside so that they could keep different units of the building locked off. And then bring the food and other services in through other entry points just to reduce the risk of spreading you know that virus from an infected area to a non-infected area you know the, the infrastructure challenges have have um you know placed an increased um, um burden on the ability to manage that that virus and that's not an easy fix right? That's major capital construct. That's not an easy fix, but it's something that we know in a situation like this is um, really challenges and a, a facility's ability to respond. We have seen a serious reduction in admissions capacity. So the commissioner mentioned patient flow, and, and this I, I, I do hope we can do a deeper dive on. I, I think, you know, maybe we're not ready for a full reflection and series of recommendations on what to do going forward, but some of the things that are already becoming quite obvious, you know, that patient flow from the hospital to the nursing home, either for that short stay rehab or for a long-term stay has been severely impacted. You know, when a new admission comes in, like I mentioned, they have to quarantine. So that's taking up all of those rooms for a minimum of, of 14 days. So that has oftentimes reduced a nursing home's capacity by 20 to 30%. So folks back up in the hospital. Also taking up quarantine space are our residents that frequently have to leave the building to go out for medical appointments like dialysis three or four times a week. A dialysis patient is in quarantine all the time because they're high risk and they're leaving the building. One area that the facilities have noted um, for future consideration is to have one or two nursing facilities in the state who can do dialysis so that we can reduce the risk of exposure to a group of patients like that who are probably some of the highest risk patients. You know, They're at risk during transport to the dialysis center, they're at risk being in the dialysis center. So that's a that's an area where we feel we need to have a conversation. Um, there are a lot of re regulatory components to that, but um, also we've been you know challenged with some of the more challenging populations, um, whether that's folks that have mental health needs or substance abuse needs. You know, managing um, their needs with the lack of mental health, you know, counselors and substance abuse counselors and the ability to bring those services to the to the nursing facility has been a real challenge. I think that's an area, you know, down the road for some uh, exploration and that's been exacerbated um, in this pandemic. Dementia patients has it's been 
incredibly challenging uh, to manage the dementia population because they wander, because they don't necessarily have the capacity to wear their mask. Um, so managing the infection control um, when it comes to um, dementia folks, they, they might need a minimum of one to one. One, one staff just to consistently, you know, monitor and assist that resident to be able to, um, to be in the facility. That's been incredibly, incredibly challenging for folks. And I think, you know, what it certainly tells us when I look at some of the challenges that we've had with the um, admissions piece between the hospitals and the nursing homes in particular, um, you know, we had a, a backup of roughly 50 patients at UVM Medical Center that were in need of uh, SNF level of care. Um, the commissioner and I and facilities worked pretty hard to try to resolve or at least release some of that pressure. It, it took money, it took staffing. Um, but I think what it certainly um, confirms is that there's a very high level of care that hospitals need the nursing facilities to provide and, and we need to find ways to build that capacity and to do it more effectively going forward. Um, and then similarly, you know, the residential care homes and assisted living there, they kind of, they, you know, really sort of stop taking admissions. They have a much more stable, truly longer term care population, but, you know, they were very hesitant to take somebody coming out of a nursing home that, you know, could have used a lower level of care um, out of fear, understandably, because again, their ability to manage positive situations, um, you know, was much less than it was even at the nursing home level. So that definitely created some flow issues across, across the system. Having said that, um, you know, Again, I think Vermont has done an amazing job with this. I think we are very lucky to have the leadership that we have uh, and also the partnership and assistance from the legislature. So we greatly appreciate that. And I'll stop there if, if anybody has any questions. I'm sure we, <clears throat> I'm sure we have questions. Um, And uh, however, we may be saving those for another day. <laughs> Happy to return. <laughs> Thank you, because really this is, um, um, I feel like I was sitting down to, uh, to Thanksgiving dinner and my eyes were bigger than my stomach. And there are um, four people who are clearly not who we need to hear from, whether it's today whether it's this afternoon or another day that we clearly, um, I put too much on the table um, for, uh, <clears throat> and so um, thank you, Laura. And um, this is to um, Gail and Susan and Janet and Molly. Um, we have uh, 15 minutes left and that is not at all um, sufficient for um, the time um, to hear from you and, I, and um, others who have, whether it is the commissioner or the long-term care ombudsman or uh, Laura, the lobbyist, you may have other things to do. And isn't this nice that um, these are uh, on YouTube now so that if you can't be here, um, you can listen to it on YouTube. Um, I am wondering um, if, uh, Gail, Sue, Janet, or Molly, if any of you are um, available um, even this afternoon at 1.15. Um, we are, um, yes. um, so um, I can't, um, who? Yes, this is Gail, I'm, a, I'm available this afternoon. Okay. This um, is Sue, I'm also available. Thank you, Sue. Um, and if, if Janet and Molly, um, if are you available? And if not, we can do another time. Uh, this is Janet, and yes, I can be. Okay. Um, and Molly. Yes, I, I can be as well. I do have a like a three o'clock uh, commitment okay. though. So as long as. Um, well, I mean, this is um, I, I'm going to as I'm looking to the four of you. Um, we probably have um, an hour and a half 
in the afternoon um, because we um, we are um, we are leaving at three. Uh, we are leaving at three um, this week. Um, although it says three thirty, um, we need to stop at three this Friday, and we also have to have a um, committee discussion on our principles. And uh, so we need some time for that. So um, it's about an hour and a half, which would mean um, depending, I don't know how long, I don't wanna cut anyone short, um, but people have um, up to this point have had a lot to say. Um, so I don't know how many of you, like how long you were thinking of speaking. Well, I can tell you that my part is probably about five-ish minutes or so, and then okay. Sue will take it from there. And Sue, are you um, 15 minutes, half an hour? What are you? I, I would think maybe about uh, five to 10 minutes. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, Janet, what about you? <clears throat> I can't hear you, Janet. I'm sorry, I would say about 10 minutes. That's all, really? Okay, okay. I could go longer. No, 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 okay. Um, um, so um, the four of you, I appreciate your flexibility. If we could um, pick up with you um, at 1.15 um, this afternoon, that would be um, great. Um, and uh, I realize, um, we may very well want, um, Sean and, uh, the, and Commissioner, I realize that you can't spend your whole day here, so you can, <laughs> um, um, it, when things come up, um, we will certainly circle back to you. And um, Sean, um, I'm struck by how even when, the, um, when Laura was speaking, some of what she was talking about are in fact recommendations in your report. So we may want to um, more specifically have you go through each one of those recommendations in terms of what are things we might be able to tackle this year and what we might not be able to. So, um, uh, that, that's fine, whatever, whatever works for you, feel free to reach out and I can make time available. Okay. 